OK. <laughs> Should I use the microphone? OK. <laughs> Microphone is not working. <laughs> I'll try the second one. Hello? Hello? Second one is also not working. <laughs> so, okay, so I will have to speak up, I guess. So, what? Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. So, my name is Radek Ezek. I work here at, at Atacama as a Python engineer. And I'm really excited and happy to see so many people came here. I hope you didn't just come for the food. <laughs> but I tried like really hard to put as many buzzwords as possible in the abstract, so I guess it worked. <laughs> so I hope it will be interesting for everybody. So I, it was introduced already, so I, I will just start uh, with the motivation and what the problem really is. So basically it's quite simple. like. You have power lines everywhere, hundreds of kilometers of them. Like ever since I started this project, I just noticed them everywhere. And like sometimes they go through densely vegetated areas like forests. And obviously like the, there's the potential for a tree colliding with the wires. And that's what you want to uh, avoid. So there's one example of like what can happen if a tree touches the wire, it's actually the it's called the California Camp Fire, and it's the biggest fire in the history of California. And it was caused by a poorly maintained corridor in the forest. And actually, the company, the Pacific Gas and Electric, uh, was held responsible for this, and they faced like 30 billion dollars in liabilities, and they managed to like cut it down to 13.5 billion dollars that went to the victims, because actually 85 people died in this fire. So it's quite serious. Uh, and then on the right, there is like the solution to the, to the problem. So it actually has two parts. So first, like you, you would imagine that you can just cut down all the trees uh, like regularly, but it's not possible. You have like hundreds of kilometers and it's extremely expensive to do it like every year, everywhere. So first you need to identify the areas that are problematic. Uh, so and th then you can follow up and like do this crazy thing, which is a helicopter that has actually a chainsaw. Uh, it's like a giant chainsaw cutting the trees. So I think that's kind of cool. But as you can imagine, like it's extremely expensive to do it regularly. So you need first to scout the locations. So that's that's our task. Like uh, actually, the goal is to measure like the distance between the the tree and the wire. And there is some reg legislation around that. Uh, so in Czech Republic. Uh, it depends on the voltage and like for example for 220 kilovolts it needs to be 50 meter, meters from the wire. So uh, that's what uh, everybody's trying to measure and they were previously using different methods to uh, achieve this for example satellites uh, or like sending people there but they all have kind of disadvantages for example the satellites are uh, very low resolution and extremely expensive and people cannot go everywhere like mountains for example. So they also try to use uh, helicopters, and they are regularly using helicopters, but they are quite expensive to uh, to run, and they are not automated. So it's kind of a perfect application for a drone, which can be automated. Uh, it's light. Uh, it can be easily operated by one person without any like uh, special uh, flight permit. So uh, it's actually quite good. So about the drone. Uh, so this is this is the drone that we uh, applied for this. It's the DJI Metris 600. It's a professional dro drone. It has like no kind of safety mechanisms. So if your battery dies, it just flies down, falls down, or like no obstacle avoidance whatsoever. So you, you are expected to know what you are doing. <laughs> <laughs> and next to it, we have the. Uh, it's a base station for like making the GPS signal more precise because the drone uh, sometimes the like the default GPS sensors on the drones are not that precise, so sometimes it like wiggles in the air and drops altitude. Uh, so this is, it helps improving the precision, and also we write the GPS coordinates to the images that the drone takes. So it also helps with the precision of the image position. So this is the payload that we have uh, had on the drone. Uh, so it's a mirrorless camera with 25 millimeter lens. It's mounted on this gimbal, which allows it to rotate all around, and 
then we have a few boxes. We have the uh, Air Commander Entire, uh, which is a small computer that runs Linux and it writes uh, the GPS positions into the metadata of the images and it also triggers the camera. So in case you are wondering like how insanely complicated all this is, like there is uh, like about five or six computers on board of this and they all have to work in sync and like for example the camera is triggered by this LED uh, infrared light because this is apparently the way how you control camera these days and it comes the, the signal comes from this entire which is connected through the wires with the uh, flight controller that is on top of the drone and then like you control it through your remote control which is connected to a phone which is connected to a computer so it's a quite complicated thing to maintain uh, how do you make it fly so as you can imagine it's not easy like manually to fly the drone for hundreds of kilometers and be absolutely accurate about the position of each image and like because like all this what is all of this boils down is that we want to create a 3d model of the uh, terrain and of the wires and there is a set of like standards and procedures for building 3d models out of images and you need uh, for example, you need to maintain a certain altitude, a certain precision. Like if your wires are two centimeters thick, then uh, you need to see them at least in two pixels to be able to recognize that it's a wire. Like if the uh, resolution is too small, then you wouldn't even see it on the picture. So uh, this kind of affects how, fly, how high you can fly. And also like, you need to sample the photographs regularly because you want uh, some kind of high overlap you need like to see the same uh, spot on the ground from many different uh, angles and perspectives. So there is a software for it that automates all of this, uh, and you just like put in the properties of your camera and uh, how much you want the overlap and how precise, and it will just generate a flight path for you. So basically, you take off with the drone, you uh, climb up to several meters, and then you click a button, and the drone starts flying on its own. Now, the, the drone that I showed you is cost about half a million check, check rounds and it's not insurable, like no one will uh, insure it. <laughs> like we tried, but it's, it's not possible to do it. So like it's flying there on its own and you are trying that some, somehow it will work out and it will not fall down because it has no safety mechanisms. So it's a bit stressful, but like on top of that, like the software gives you some kind of like nice error messages all, all the time. Some of them are useful, some of them are not. Uh, but it always sounds like a nuclear uh, attack is about to come. So, <laughs> so this is like the sort of sound that you get uh, every two minutes when the drone is flying on its own. Uh, <laughs> you are kind of worried, sick, what, what is happening. So this happens when the battery voltage is low. Uh, there's the next one that like, you should probably land at this point. <laughs> but we didn't, so <laughs> like, very confident in the abilities. And then like, this is my personal fa favorite. The execution could not be executed. Like, I have no idea what it means. <laughs> so <laughs> okay. Okay, so enough with the introduction now, let's get technical. So, you, with this process you captured uh, some images, so you have like, a, like a, a group of images and they all have GPS coordination written into the metadata. And how do you build a 3D model out of this? Or how do you actually measure distances between the wires and the trees? So I already spoiled it, so you will build a 3D model, uh, actually two 3D models, one is of the terrain itself. This can be done like with a standard software that's available, available on the market, but it's not very good with thin homogeneous structures. So it cannot capture the, the wires because they look the same across all of the photographs. And then, so, so for that reason, there will be a second step, which is the cornerstone of the work, uh, which is the power line reconstruction pipeline, which will build the 3D models of just the power lines. And then we will just combine them together, calculate the distances between the two 3D models, and that's the final result. So let's start with the photogrammetric pipeline. So this is a standard way uh, of building 3D models out of images. 
so there is plenty of software available. I chose one of the open source ones. It's, it's called Open Drone Map. Uh, it has like high quality algorithms, but it's a pain to work with. Like it ate up about 300 or 200 gigabytes of memory. So it had to be run on like a powerful cluster just to not crash. And it runs about 10 hours uh, for the resolution that we, that we needed. Uh, and what it produces, so like, well actually how it works. So first there, there is a structure for motion step, which is basically if you ever took a panorama photo with your uh, t uh, phone and you wondered how that works, uh, it basically like finds some distinct points across the images, like some corners of objects or like sharp uh, changes in the brightness of the pixels. And then it tries to match those points across multiple images. And from that information, like if you have the same point in two different images and you know where the images were taken, you can calculate the 3D location of the point. And you can build something that is called a point cloud, so which, is, which is this image. So the point cloud is really just a set of points, nothing else. It's a, they have X, X, Y, Z uh, coordinate and they have a color, that's it. And then also like conveniently it produces like uh, information about the cameras. So you put in images and it tells you like, hey, this, the, this image was taken here. Like the red dots represent the position of the camera, but you also know the rotation. And you also know something that is called camera intrinsic, which give you uh, sort of the parameters of the lens, like the distortion that is happening, so you can correct for it. So here you have a fish-eyed lens, and you need to correct for it so it actually appears straight. And you need to do this because every camera has these kind of uh, aberrations. Uh, so but if you want to take measurements from the images and want to be at least a little bit precise, then you need to do this step. So it's called image undistortion, and it actually produces the undistorted images already. So that's the terrain point cloud. You, you can see like some of the, you can see the terrain, you can see the transmission towers and like some of the wires were reconstructed, but like most of it is missing. And there were actually five wires, but only three are visible in this uh, cloud. So it's not used good for, even though the resolution was really high and we tried a lot to have the best quality reconstruction, it's not possible to do it just uh, with this software. So that's where the second part comes in, which is the cornerstone of the work. And so the goal of this part is to build a 3D model of the wires. Also, the result will be a point cloud, but we will have like a deep geometric understanding of each wire and how many wires there are. And then we can like just combine the point clouds and calculate how far they are from each other. And that's the result. Uh, so all of these properties that came from the uh, uh, photogrammetric pipeline uh, go in at different points. But how, how can you achieve this? So like previously the model was done by some standardized method. Now like how do we build the 3D models from set of images of the wires? So the first thing you might imagine is identifying the wires in the images. So identifying which pixels exactly from the image belong to the wire and which are background. So that's the power line segmentation. So that's the first step. So you put in an image and you end up with something like this, which is the binary segmentation mask. It has zeros. Uh, it's an image, it's a matrix. It has zeros for background, ones for uh, the wires. Uh, so there are like two very common approaches how to do this. One of them is uh, using the traditional methods from computer vision, uh, which basically it's in very like defined, structured way allows you to uh, understand what's going on and applies a certain set of filters and thresholds. So in the, in this like this is the original photograph. In this first step, there is like a decorrelation stretch just to like preprocessing step to even out the histogram of the uh, color values. Then you apply some sort of edge detector filter, which if you know is like a convolution with a filter matrix. It's very basic computer vision operation. It's the same thing that happens in uh, convolutional neural networks. Uh, but now we have like a fixed filter that we define. And the last step is just taking the highest values from this image. So this produces some like uh, edges, which are the uh, big transitions between like dark and bright values. So like the 
uh, the wires are right, uh, white on this picture, and the background is mostly dark. So there is, it's identifying these big uh, differences. And if you take just the highest, the one percent of the highest values, you end up with, the, with this image. Mm -hmm. And but as you can see, it's not perfect. Like there's some noise, uh, and also like it's working solely on the. Uh, edge detection, so if there is some other edge, like a rail or a road underneath the wires, it will also detect it. I will show that later. So the, that was the first approach, and the sec second most pop popular approach nowadays is using the neural networks. So I also try to use a neural network. I used it as a black box, basically, it was pre-trained. So uh, I, I included this slide for the architecture if you are neural network fans, but I don't really understand it. <laughs> <laughs> but like the, the input is here, for example, the image of a cat and the output is, uh, it's very poorly visible there, but it's a segmentation mask. So per pixel classification of what object is there. Maybe it will be more visible here. So the model, the DeepLab V3 plus that I used was pre-trained on the Cityscapes data set. Uh, which example of it is here. So it has pixel-wise annotations for uh, different objects. And it also has like these nice thin gray poles that look kind of like the wires. Uh, but actually I found uh, another data set that was open source and available on the internet uh, with nice uh, per pixel annotations of the wires. Uh, I just removed the transmission towers because they are not important for this and just fine-tuned the model on this. And surprisingly, it, it, it worked very well. So this is the comparison between the traditional methods. As you can see, there is like part of the transmission tower, there is some road, uh, but the neural network kind of like deeply understands the scenes and know what is a wire and what is not a wire, uh, hopefully. <laughs> and, and so it, it produces like cleaner uh, segmentation mask. So the next step that you need to do. So this is not enough. It's like you have only identified which pixels uh, corresponds to the wires. But now you actually want to know, like, yes, I have five wires in this image and they, they have like this uh, equation of the, uh, of the line. So they are like, they start at this point and at this point. Uh, so you can apply something that is called half-line transformation. It's uh, also from computer vision. And what it does is like, it's very complicated, I will not explain it. <laughs> but uh, what, it, what it does, it finds uh, lines in the images. So it looks at the pixels, it needs the segmentation mask, it looks at the uh, things and it tries to identify lines. But it's not perfect. And like for one uh, single line here, it produces like tens of lines. So it's like a cluster or group of lines. And also there is some noise, for example, here. So you need to filter all that out and identify only the, uh, like that this is one wire and not like 20. So how you can do that, it's using uh, clustering. Basically, so I, I like clustered uh, the, the groups of lines that the algorithm detected, first based on angle. So I calculated the angle between the x-axis and the, uh, the line. And then uh, I clustered like everything that was further than one degree uh, was a separate cluster. So you can see it's actually visualized on this image. So this is one cluster, green and red. Here's the corresponding three clusters. So that, that's not enough because we want five, not three. So you can then cluster it also based on the distance to this point, which is like the beginning of the image, and you get nice five lines. So now you have clusters. And each cluster corresponds to one power line, but it contains like tens of li detected lines. So how, how you can deal with that is just like sample some points. These are the blue points from the lines and just fit a line through them. And you have a nice geometric representation of the thing. And actually, like you also need to deal with the curvatures of the wires because the wires are not straight. They can like curve in the images. So I just like split the whole image into small vertical segments. I did this clustering in each of them and then merged them back, back together and had a nice uh, like polyline representation or segments of line representation for each power line. So it has some drawbacks. It's not perfect. Like the, here you can see uh, there's like actually two wires 
very close to each other. It was detected just as one. Uh, but as long as you have like at least seven pixels between uh, the two wires, you can uh, detect them separately in most cases. So it works, works pretty well. Uh, so, okay. So now you have the images, you know the exact rotation, position, uh, and how many power lines are there in the images. So you have a lot of information and you need to combine it from all the images into the 3D model, like uh, obtain the 3D points from the images. So how can you do this? So first, I will like sort of categorize the images and like sort them and where, where each image belongs. So there is like a, there's this view of the, point, the, the red points. These are the camera positions where the image was taken. You can just like look at it from the bird, bird eye view and see them in 2D plane. And then you can actually classify like, okay, like this is, you can fit the line, this is the blue line. And then based on the distance to the line, you can classify, okay, this is the left strip, this is the middle strip, and this is the right strip. And the reason why they are colored is that you actually want like groups of three images, one after each other, uh, that are like parallel and they are looking from three different views at the same uh, place in the wires, uh, in the corridor. So this is kind of where it gets a little bit complicated, but uh, I will try to explain as, <laughs> as best as I can. So uh, basically you can, you can use the information about the camera position, rotation, and everything, the uh, intrinsics, and you can calculate like relative position to another image. So like you, you have groups of three images. You select two images from the three. The third one, sorry, I forgot to explain. The third one is just for robustness. So if the, there is a case that the wires overlap, as I showed you before, uh, then you can just uh, skip the image and you still have two. So you need two images to do this kind of sterile view and reconstruct the 3D point. And also you need uh, to know like that this power line corresponds to this one. So I just sorted them le left to right. So the red one here, red one here, and that's it. And then like you can select like, any point on this uh, power line and you will get a correspond like from all of this information and a bit of this mathematics, you will get a corresponding point on the second one. And then you can just triangulate to create the 3D point. But this is the happy case where like uh, you can simply sort them and there is like five, you, you know there is five wires in the images, so there's five on the left, five on the right. But sometimes like around the tower lines, the, the, the towers, it gets a bit complicated. So you need to kind of work around it. So you can actually take this point that you just reconstructed and you can project it to the next image and see, oh yeah, this is the red power line because you don't know yet. Like, so then, Okay, then, then you have like the 3D points. So you recon triangulated the 3D points. You get this sort of 3D view and there's some outliers. So you want to filter them out so you can fit the physical model of the wire, which is the catenary curve model. And you can fit it robustly using something called a random sample consensus algorithm. So you can basically uh, ignore those outliers because like normal regression would not uh, capture these and it would like be uh, confused about it. So that's it. Now there are two point clouds. One, one is of the uh, terrain, second one is of the wires. Now we just combine, uh, the, combine them together, calculate the differences. And this is done in a tool that is called uh, Cloud Compare. It is also open source. And uh, it's like one click of a button, you can just compute the distances. And you get this. So it's, this is a view of the power line corridor. So green is uh, like further than 15 meters, red is uh, closer. So here it is about 13.5 meters from the wire and you can get the GPS coordinates of that place. So you can see there is something wrong there. You, you might need to cut it. Like you may adjust for the different uh, uh, like requirements for height and width. So you can like have it a bit nicer. So you can see clearly the red parts are sort of problematic. Everything else is fine. So we took three data sets. One of them I showed you already. We tried uh, some, el some else. Uh, so this, it, it always had five wires. 
these are 220 kilovolt uh, power lines. Uh, so this is one, this is second, and that's it. There is some results. So there, there is a comparis comparison of the uh, how many, how much of the wires were reconstructed from the neural network on the left and from the uh, traditional methods on the right. So you can see in the third data set it was really confused, and there was like poor lighting conditions as well. But the neural network still handled it. And for the accuracy, you can actually take from the terrain points. So some of those points were reconstructed still, even though it's difficult for the homogeneous structures. So I just took those points and compared them with the reconstructed, geometrically reconstructed uh, power lines. And this is the difference. So like, it's a bit confused on the first data set, but on the second and third, it's like average distance is seven centimeters or 18 centimeters, which I think is really good. But we didn't have any sort of ground truth data because this is really hard to obtain. And you need a laser scanner, for example, and it's expensive and stuff. So it was out of scope of this work. So that's, that's it for the work. Now, I wouldn't be talking to you if I implemented this in Java. So, <laughs> so obviously, there, are, there is some Python there. So I just wanted to po point out the libraries that you can use to do some, something like this or similar. So anyone who already tried something with computer vision, you will know OpenCV. It's a very popular library, so that uh, can do anything with the images, like the traditional segmentation. Then uh, this, this uh, library or framework included the neural network. So you can just take it, run it, configure it a little bit, and uh, pre-train it on your data set. Uh, and it works out of the box. Uh, then I used the uh, Cicid and Cicid image for some of the uh, like robust fitting, the Ranzak algorithm. Uh, Shapely for geometry, that's a very nice one. Like it can only do 2D geometry, but it's very powerful. It can do like intersections and convex hulls and every, all of these things. So that's a good one. Uh, and uh, something for package management, so, and running the tasks. Uh, this one is not in Python, but it has Python connector to it. That's for the reconstruction from the photogrammetry. So building 3D models for images, from images. So if you want to build the 3D models from anything, you can just take your phone and like go around the rooms, room and take some pictures. You can just put it there and it will build you a 3D model or any other software like this. There's like paid versions that are quite good. And lastly, there's the cloud compare for the visualization comparing, working with point cloud. Okay, so that's it. So what questions do you have? Okay, so uh, are there any direct questions from the audience? Because that's less, okay, so we take precedence. So, for how long was the drone able to fly? Because it was quite big, uh, from yeah. experience, the big drones uh, like don't. So it's about 20 minutes. Okay. So okay. I, we, we managed to fly like 500 meters uh, with the three flight strips. So, and but it, then you can swap out the batteries. We had like three kits. You can just swap out the batteries. And while the drone is doing another mission, you can recharge the old ones. So if you have enough kits of batteries, you can just fly all day. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh -huh. can, you, can you do the wires just by physics? Uh, what do you mean by physics? Because you like, know like, where, they are. where they start? Yeah. Yes, if you identify the precise point where they start, you should be able to, like, it's not important the altitude as much as the, like, uh, the distance from the trees, mm -hmm. so, but like they are due to different like uh, weather conditions, they can change in altitude, but it, if that's not important to you, then you can just ba do it based on physics. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, okay. Uh, was there some limit how far or how high about the lines where you to fly? Like, could you just come closer to see the lines better? Or is there like a, some sort of kind of similar around that you have to respect? Uh, is there some regulation? Yes. <laughs> 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 Next one. <laughs> 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 we fly about 70 meters above ground and the wires were about 20 to 30 meters above ground. So there was enough room. So but you need, you need permission to do it. So maybe a few questions from Slido. So that we okay. Run. Okay, question there. So, um, first question: Did you consider using a lidar instead of camera on the top of that? Well, 
it's, it's possible to do it using LiDAR. There are some studies that uh, try to do it using LiDAR, but it's like, first it's very expensive to buy this thing for a drone, and also hard to get. And then it's like very uh, hard to work with the data because sometimes they are not precise enough. You have to do the flight again. So we just decided to go with the mainstream and just use, use images, okay. which is much more versatile. Another alternative uh, solution for you, I see. Uh, flying uh, along very long lines might be a good task for a glider, isn't it? Uh, it can fly for dozens of kilometers, and uh, how could you compare it with uh, copters? Oh. So. Glider, you mean the drone with wings? I don't know. I guess, yeah. I guess yeah, yeah, so, yeah, because okay. I think the trees, like when they are searching for urovets, yeah. they are using the gliding drones. Yeah, I think that's, that's the goal eventually. It's quite hard to get it uh, in, into the air and like manage it because it's not as uh, versatile as the uh, quad or uh, hexacopter. So eventually it should be possible. But you also need to fly higher. It's just more hassle to work with those. But it can fly like tens of kilometers at one recharge. So for this application, it's much more ideal. Do you have a customer for this, or is it like a fun? No, if there is anyone in the audience. <laughs> 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 I'm like no, just asking if it's like a fun project to work on, or uh, why, why? It's my diploma thesis. Oh, that's your so, thesis. Yeah. Okay. Oh. So, uh, another question, uh, maybe a very personal one. Uh, what was the biggest pain during your work? <laughs> biggest pain? I don't know. <laughs> like I, the biggest pain would be if I had to like actually work with the drone and like connect all this up and actually fly it because that that's what my supervisor helped me a lot with. So I didn't actually pilot the drone because I don't want to lose five hundred uh, thousand check rounds. But and I, also I don't have the flying permit. You need to actually to have a license for it. So that would be kind of difficult for me. Oh, the biggest. Okay, now I know. So the the, the open drone map, the software. It, like, it runs for 10 hours, but it, at some points it might just crash because it ran out of memory. So you like, run it overnight, you go to sleep, and every, every morning you wake up and there is an error because it crashed. So that happened to me like 20 times. <laughs> so that was kind of painful. But then we figured it out, gave it like 300 gig gigabytes of RAM, and it was happy, finally. So <laughs> okay, so there is the, the last uh, online question, and that's maybe a bit uh, related to this. Um, how long does it take to calculate all this? Uh, meaning, how long does your cluster need to run to get yeah. all information per, per meter right. of line? So, the 3D reconstruction from the software, from the open drone map, that runs about 10 hours, as I already said, but it also depends on the lightning conditions. So, if you have moving shadows in the image when it's sunny, it can take twice as long for some reason. Mm -hmm. And this algorithm, like the reconstructing the power lines, that takes about uh, one hour. Per, per, per there are 500 meters of the lines. Okay. Okay. okay you did like 200 images, was it? Yes, you okay. So, and that was the last online, que uh, online question. So, are there any more like live questions? Or... Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, no. But we actually lost the drone once. So, <laughs> so it was flying there on its own, and sometimes it like loses the connection between the controller and the drone, and it was like behind the trees. So you, we couldn't see it on the display on the controller, but we couldn't even see it with our own eyes. So we were just hoping it will eventually come back because there is some failover, like if it loses connection. But and it did, but like it was a stressful moment. <laughs> Why did you choose Python for doing this? What is that? Is, are you suggesting Julia? Or <laughs> <laughs> okay, no, no. I heard Python is not very very fast um, language, so yeah, there is a lot of lot of uh, you know computing. And yeah, the goal was not to be extremely fast, and also the library for the photogrammetry, which takes the ten hours, is implemented in C, and you can just use it. It's like a free project. Uh, and my algorithm took just one hour, so compared to that, I decided it's no okay. point. And there is an amazing ecosystem of libraries and everything, so I wouldn't like be able to implement this in C or Java or anything because OpenCV is not well, OpenCV is there, but Shapely is not there. <laughs> okay. So like half of the site is in Fortran, right? <laughs> yeah, these libraries are kind of highly optimized. Okay, other questions. Yeah. Would the second drone help you? 
Second drone. Uh, it would be faster, so maybe. <laughs> but they would have to like maintain the overlap to be like close to each other. Yeah, it would be possible. Okay, well, I have one bonus video for you. This is some, some, somewhat related, but I actually found a drone that has a flamethrower flame thrower <laughs> that burns the stuff down from the power lines. No. So <laughs> if, like, now you know all of this can be automated and it can fly on its own. So if you are not afraid of AI, now you should be. <laughs> so. so birds sitting on a wire, for example. <laughs> okay, that's it. So if you want, you can reach me out. There is the code. If you want to see the code on my GitLab, you can reach me out uh, on Gmail or ask me any questions here. <laughs>